So kinetic molecular theory, that, that said, let's talk about the parts of it and then let's use it to explain the laws that we've already mentioned. First of all, we need to look at some assumptions. All right. So here are some assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory. One, the particles are so small compared with the distances between them that the volume of individual particles can as be assumed to be zero or, or negligible or zero. We've already talked about that. The individual particles can be assumed to take up no space because the space between them is so much bigger. The average kinetic energy of a collection of gas particles is assumed to be directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. So let's look at that. Temperature is directly proportional. Have you seen that symbol before? It, I mean, it's sort of like equals, but not equals implies an equation that you solve. Proportional just means it varies with. Right? Uh, the kinetic molecular, or the, the kinetic energy, or the average kinetic energy, which if you haven't taken physics, is at one half mv squared. Why is that important? Well, we often think of the temperature as being proportional to velocity. That is, as temperature goes up, atoms are moving around faster. And that's sort of true, but it's proportional to the kinetic energy, which is one half the mass times the velocity squared. And the reason that's important is because of this mass term. If temperature were only proportional to velocity, then it wouldn't matter what type of particle you have. The molecular weight wouldn't matter. If they were moving at the same speed, you'd have the same temperature. Because it's proportional to kinetic energy, that's not the case. A larger thing and a smaller thing moving at the same speed, the larger thing has more kinetic energy and therefore is a higher temperature. So it's a way of taking mass into account when we talk about temperature, mass and velocity. Um, the particles are assumed to exert no forces on each other. So these theories uh, wouldn't work as well if gases that came close to each other kind of stuck there for a while and then went apart, or if there were attractive forces. Now, we know there are actually attractive forces. But in a gas, the molecules are on average so far apart that those forces become less important. When we talk about how gases are not ideal later, we'll talk about where, when, how that's important. And then finally, the particles are in constant motion. So you assume that all particles are flying around in a, um, in a, in a con given container, are always flying around. And the cause of pressure is actually the collisions of the particles with the, with the uh, edges of the container. So, instead of, so we talk about pressure as being sort of net collisions. How many collisions are happening with the walls? If you increase collisions, you increase pressure. If you decrease the collisions with the walls, you decrease pressure. So this idea of pressure, this thing that we measure, the reason behind pressure is said to be particles of gas hitting walls, hitting the walls of a container, and that causes the pressure. Gases don't conform perfectly to this model, but it's a model. And we can predict what will happen, like Boyle's law, Charles law, all these things. We can actually predict all these laws by the tenets of this theory. All right. So let's apply this now. Oh, and there's one more thing that's not said here. All collisions are assumed to be elastic. You know what that means? What does that mean? They don't stick together. They bounce off each other. Yeah, they don't stick together. They bounce off each other. So here's an elastic collision, like two billiard balls hitting, and they go, they come apart. Without, losing, without transferring any energy to each other or losing any energy in the process. And then an inelastic collision is like two piles of clay that you smash together, and they might dissipate some of that energy as heat. So an elastic collision means none of the energy is lost or transferred when uh, atoms collide. OK. So let's talk about these, some of these laws and how this works. We know Boyle's law says that uh, pressure and volume are directly proportional. Right? You increase pressure, you increase volume. So what we say, with, if we want to say, well, why does that happen? Why? Kinetic molecular theory says, well, if you decrease the volume, you're going to have more collisions because the same amount of particles are now in a smaller space. And if you increase collisions, 
you increase pressure because we've defined pressure as being the collisions of the gas. So in that way, we've ex explained the theory behind this law. We've explained why we see this, why pressure and volume change with each other. It's because when volume decreases, the pressure, the collisions, must increase. Okay. So we'll, we'll try some of these in, in different ways. Pressure and temperature, same thing. So I say, well, why, why uh, does pressure decrease when temperature decreases? Well, the kinetic energy, uh, well, let's go with increases. See, stay constant. If the temperature increases, we said temperature is proportional to kinetic energy. So temperature increasing means everything's going, a lot, going around a lot faster, right? And if everything's going around a lot faster, it's again causing more collisions, hitting the walls a bunch more. Therefore, you have an increase in pressure. Okay. So again, we've explained why there's an increase in pressure with an increase in temperature using these things. Charles' law, same thing. See if you can, see if you can do this one. Volume decreases, then temperature decreases. Or you can say, when temperature increases, we must also have an increase in volume if pressure is held constant. So why do you think that is? Why? Using this theory that we've talked about, talking about kinetic energy and collisions, why should volume increase when temperature increases? Well, but we said we were holding pressure constant. Well, yes, but why from the theory? Right, so this one kind of takes one little extra step. You, if you increase the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy of the, of the molecules. They're flying around more, faster, right? And that's increasing collisions. Well, collisions is pressure, right? So if we need to keep pressure constant, what do we have to do? Increase the space. So if you increase the space, now those faster molecules are making fewer collisions because there's more space, so statistically they're hitting the walls less often. Same idea. All right, what about Avogadro's law? When temperature and pressure are constant, the number of moles increases with, with volume. So why does volume increase when number of moles increases? You got more stuff. So let's formulate kind of a, because this happens, this happens, and this happens way of, of saying it. STP, I think, you have said number of moles. Mm -hmm. Because of collisions, there are different At a certain pressure, okay. Right, and if you add more, therefore it should increase proportionally because there are certain amount of collisions. Yes, but specifically, okay, so you're saying volume then. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know if you heard that, but um, it's as if you increase the amount of moles, that's another way of increasing collisions because now there's more stuff flying around at the same speed, you know, same kinetic energy. So you have more collisions. But more collisions is pressure, and we're keeping pressure constant. Um, so, oh, and temperature constant, right? So you either got more pressure or you got more temperature. The only way to keep those things constant is to, again, have more space for the stuff to go around it. So the volume must increase so those molecules have the space to fly around without increasing the pressure, without increasing collisions. And then um, Dalton's law, this is also predicted by Dalton's law because we assume that the gases are independent of each other. So it's sort of like um, the, the collisions of each gas add up to the total collisions, which is like saying the partial pressure of each gas adds up to the total partial pressure, or total pressure. Okay. And then uh, we can actually derive this through kinetic energy. Um, I don't want to get too much into the math here. I don't think it's totally necessary. But the final idea actually is, is important. And so it's using these ideas of physics to actually derive some of what's going on in a container of gas. So remember that we can say that temperature in Kelvin indicates the average kinetic energy of gas particles. That is, PV equals NRT equals two-thirds of the average kinetic energy. Okay. And you, don't, you won't need to use this 
I'll, I'll let you know when you need to use an, an equation. Um, this is kind of all part of the derivation. So we can say the average kinetic energy is 3 halves times RT, times you know, the temperature, because it's proportional to the temperature. And we know the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, so half times the mass times the square of the velocity. All right. So this tells us that, that we can say something about the velocity. Um, and now let's use, let's use some more gas terms, <laughs> I guess to say, to look at something called the root mean square velocity, which is a type of average. Root mean square is a type of average. And we can actually derive this from the temperature in Kelvin and the mass, the, the molar mass in, in uh, kilograms. And that's the only trick here is it has to be in kilograms, which you don't usually say. The other way to express this equation sometimes is the square root of 3RT over M. Okay. And we use the other R here because we ultimately want units of energy uh, so they will cancel to velocity. So we've got joule, which is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And that gives us um, this velocity. And all you really need to know with this is how to use that equation. Okay. So the root mean square velocity uh, for the atoms in a sample of helium gas at 25 degrees C is use that equation. That's going to be 3 times 8 well, R, which we're using the other R, remember. 8.31 joule, what is it? Joule per mole Kelvin or joule per, per Kelvin mole times the temperature in Kelvin, which is 298K, divided by the mass in kilograms per mole, right? The molar mass in kilograms per mole. So the molar mass of helium is four grams per mole. So that's going to be 0 0.004 kilograms per mole. So everything cancels, and you end up with Thirteen sixty-three meters per second. So that's a, a way of saying the average velocity of the helium atoms in the sample is that. Now, how do we get meters per second? Well, uh, Kelvin cancels with Kelvin, mole cancels with mole, so we end up with joules per kilogram. But remember that a joule is a kilogram meters squared per second squared. Actually, we end up with square root of joule kilograms. So a kilogram meter squared per second squared over kilogram cancels those. And we end up with the square root of meter squared per second squared, which equals meter per second. So it's kind of going in that unit of a joule that there's a kilogram in there. And you end up with meters per second. Okay, so that's the average velocity, but of course they're not just going around, they're also running into each other. So the kinetic energy tells us something about the temperature, or the, the average velocity tells us something about the kinetic energy and the temperature. Um, but we also want to know something about the pressure, this idea of collisions. And so we can figure that out by something called the mean free path. And it's the average particle distance that a particle travels between collisions. So in, uh, the, remember the atoms are all moving around, straight lines, and occasionally they run into each other. So what do you think a very short mean free path means? Yeah, the particles are hitting each other a lot. That's a short mean free path. Lots of collisions. And that can tell us, what does that tell us about pressure? Probably, yeah. Um, and so, are we going to? I don't know if we're going to calculate the mean free path, but 
for oxygen at STP, the mean free path is about 1 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, which is about, um, a uh, is that what, 100 nanometers? Right? Yeah. yeah, 100 nanometers. So that's a significant distance when you consider that the size of an atom is like 10 to the minus 11, right? 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11. So it's going a pretty big distance compared to its own size. Um, it's kind of like if you were to run, so say you're six feet tall and you're going to run um, about a thousand times, right? Yeah, a thousand times before your distance before you hit anybody. So you're in an area where the closest thing to you is a mile away, basically. More than a mile away. That's sort of, that's how big the distances between gas molecules are. It's as though you were standing there and the closest thing to you is another person a mile away. The closest thing to them is another person a mile away. It means you can run a mile without hitting somebody, basically. That's oxygen at STP. So we calculated the, the average velo the RMS velocity, the average velocity, but the actual velocities will change quite a bit. And so based on temperature, we can actually plot a distribution of these. Let me see if I can zoom this in a little bit so you can see it. So here is the variation of velocity distribution with molar mass. As something gets very light, its molecular velocity becomes a much larger range. And as something gets much heavier, not only does it slow down, but it actually has a smaller distribution also. Yeah. So you can tell something about how big a gas is by its distribution of mass, uh, or its distribution of molecular velocities. This will also, of course, change with temperature. So here's everything at standard temperature or at a fixed temperature, constant temperature. And here's what happens when you change temperature. Same thing. The higher the temperature, the larger the variety of molecular velocities you have. So not only are things move, it's not just that things are moving faster. They're just moving faster on average. In fact, there are still some gas molecules that are moving very slowly and some moving much, much, much faster. And that's always the case. Um, so it's, it's, remember, it's the average kinetic energy that's proportional to the temperature, not the individual kinetic energy of individual particles. There's always this range. OK. So a couple other kind of little things that come out of here. We can also talk about a fusion and diffusion. A couple terms you should know. Diffusion is the mixing of gases. So uh, some gas over here in a balloon, some gas over here in a balloon. You open them up, they'll mix together. We talked a little bit about that. Oh, no, we didn't. That was another class. We'll talk about that later when we talk about entropy also. And then effusion describes the passage of a gas through a tiny orifice into an evacuated chamber. So you have an empty chamber, a little hole in it, gas rushes in. And you can talk about how quickly it rushes in based on the, like, the molar mass. The, the reason effusion is important is it allows you to separate things by molar mass. That's really kind of the, the reason it is used. Um, and you can get a ratio of these rates. Now, those of you who have started on the, this, is, this figure is wrong here. It should just be that this equals this. So those of you who have started on the homework uh, 5b, there's an effusion problem on there. It's an easy equation to just plug into, but you have to keep stuff straight. The, the ratio for effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of its molar mass. Okay. So that means the larger the molar mass gets, what happens to the rate of effusion? It decreases, right? It's on the bottom. So the larger the molar mass gets, the slower it effuses through this hole, which makes sense, right? If you kind of think about a giant thing, it takes longer to get through a small hole. Have you ever seen a 500-pound person try to get into a car? Same idea. So we can use this rate to figure out something about the, um, 
effusion rates or the re relative effusion rates from gases, which you have to keep stuff straight. And this is the confusing part. Because it's inversely proportional, the uh, ratio of effusion rates flips them. Okay? So the rate of effusion for gas 1 is 1 over m1, 1 over, the, 1 over the square root of m1. And then for number 2 is 1 over the square root of m2. So that equals the square root of m2 over the square root of m1, because both of those are the reciprocal. So the ratio to 1 to 2 is the mass of 2 to 1, because of how the math works out there. So don't let that throw you. All right, let's try it. Uh, calculate the, the ratio of effusion rates of hydrogen gas and uranium hexafluoride, a gas used in the enrichment process to produce fuel for nuclear reactors. So if you can do that calculation. All right, what'd you get? So we need the molar mass of UF6, which is what? 238. And the molar mass of hydrogen is? Oh, no, that's just uranium. What's, what's uh, UF6? Uh, what? 352. The twos were louder, sorry. And hydrogen is 2. So that means that the ratio, uh, the ratio of the effusion rates, whichever one we decide on, so let's say uh, hydrogen to UF6, did you do that ratio or you did the other one? That one? Okay, what'd you get? No, you missed it on the other one. So the, the ratio of effusion of UF6 to the effusion of hydrogen is going to be the square roots of the opposite of those. So the mass of H2 over the square root of the mass of UF6. And that is... Or you could have done it the other way and gotten, what did you get? 13.2. I would be more specific in the question. So I would say the ratio of this to this. Yeah. All right, try this one. Which, assuming that, uh, Mass is proportional to size, and the gas samples are at the same temperature. Which of these has the greatest pressure? It's not on your notes. I just pulled it up here. Which of these has the greatest pressure? A, B, or C? Hmm. Everybody think about it for a second, and then I'll ask for uh, hands. This is a kinetic molecular theory question. OK. They're just at the same temperature. They have different pressures. We're asking which one's the highest pressure. So who says A is the highest pressure? Who says B is the highest pressure? Who says C is the highest pressure? All right, so we got some Bs and some Cs. Who wants to uh, speak for the one that you said? All right, why B? Somebody who said B. Because they're big. OK. What, is big, uh, what does that mean in kinetic molecular theory, molecular theory terms? They hit each other more? OK, you're going to refute that? OK, the distances are really big. So why C? Somebody said C. There's more stuff, more particles, so more collisions. Okay. Yeah, the answer in this case is C. Why is it not B though? Because those certainly take up more space. They're bigger particles. 
Because we assumed, remember, one of the key assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory is that the gas molecules take up no space because of the great vast distances between them, or among them, uh, yeah, between particles. So B, yes, they're bigger, but that doesn't matter because we assume that, that none of these take up any space, effectively. Okay. Um, also, maybe the bigger means that they're more massive. Right? They have more mass. Well, that's fine. But we assume temperature was constant, which means kinetic energy is constant. So that just means they're actually moving slower. Something larger with the same kinetic energy as something smaller, the larger thing is moving slow, more slowly. So at the same temperature, heavier particles move slower than lighter particles, which we saw in those graphs of root mean square velocity. All right. Um, yeah, we're not going to go too much into diffusion because we have conf collisions between molecules of different types and whatever. Just, you know, it happens, right? Things, the gases diffuse together. All right, let's, let's start, uh, talk a little bit now about real gases. So up to now, we've talked about ideal gases, and we've made all these assumptions about what happens when a gas to an ideal gas. Right? They have no mass, or, or they have mass, but their size doesn't matter. Um, we've talked about how the interactions among molecules don't matter. Now we're going to say, well, OK, let's bring this back to the real world. All those things actually do matter and do make a difference. So here's a graph of molar volume for different gases. You've got the ideal gas on the left, which is nothing. Nothing's an ideal gas. And then all these different gases, chlorine, carbon dioxide, ammonia, nitrogen, helium, hydrogen, which start to deviate. Now, they don't deviate a whole lot, right? 22.41. Uh, chlorine deviates the most here. But they're still all pretty close. Okay. Um, and that's good. That's good. That means that using the ideal gas law works. It won't give you the exact right number, but it'll allow you to make some predictions about what will happen and how things will change. And that's, that's what we want. So it's good that things don't deviate too much from ideality. But of course, that's pressure that's at standard temperature and pressure. As we change pressure and temperature, non-ideal gases will deviate more greatly. And so we can see that in some of these. This is known as the Van der Waals equation. And we're going to we're going to put in a couple of correction factors. So, one of the correction factors. Well, okay. One of one of the issues that we, one of the assumptions we made that's not actually true, of course, is that molecules take up no space. They do take up space. They don't take up a whole lot, but they take up some. And if there's a lot of them that space is going to become important. And if they're very big, that space is going to become important. So that leads us to our first um, our first correction factor, which is that volume is actually going to be a little bit less than what we say it is, depending on how big the, the molecules are, the number of particles, the volume of the particle. So you have this, this n is a number, but b is actually kind of a special thing. That's known as a van der Waals constant. And you can, uh, you can look it up for different gases. It's not, um, it's not trivial to know the volume of these things. It's something you sort of have to measure and then tabulate. So you look up, you look up the values for A and for B in this case. We'll talk about A. Um, OK, so let's look now at that. And then the other correction we need to uh, talk about are the attractive forces. The assumption we made in the kinetic molecular theory is that gas, gas molecules don't interact with each other because the spaces between them are too great. And that's mostly true, but not totally. They do interact with each other a little bit. And as the volume, um, or as the pressure gets very high, or the intermolecular forces become very strong, or the volume gets very small, that's going to become a much bigger issue. So the other correction is this A term, which deals with the intermolecular forces. OK, again, something you look up at a table. How are these things found? Well, it wasn't like they did some 
magical theory and calculated something about the atoms. They just made a bunch of measurements of the gases and then figured out what, what these numbers would have to be so that this gas becomes ideal. And that's what that's, so that's what this equation tells you. This is known as the Van der Waals equation. And now, if you take pressure and add a little bit of, the, uh, add a little bit here, and then volume subtracted a little bit, you correct for that and you get something that can't actually fit in this equation. And these graphs show that difference. So first, at high pressure, this is pressure now, uh, versus volume. So at high pressure, volume is higher than predicted. And that's because of the space that the molecules are taking up. So we have to account for that by subtracting a little bit. And then, at low temperature, pressure is lower than predicted. Well, why is pressure lower than predicted? because of intermolecular forces, the forces between molecules. If there were no forces, they would be colliding at such and such a rate. But since there are forces, they're attracted to each other a little bit, and they're not colliding as much as, as we would have predicted. So that's that pressure correction a little bit. Oops, went the wrong way. There we go. And the equation is important uh, for some accurate predictions. So let's try, um, let's look at some of these constants. They're not huge, and, and we can talk about some of the gases. Oops. So here are some Van der Waals constants for common gases. Based on this, which of these, so go back to the equation or look at your equation down there. Which do you think is a, um, is a less is the least ideal gas here? Yeah, carbon tetrachloride, right? Becomes hugely non-ideal. Um, right? The intermolecular forces are so strong that you have to have this very large correction factor uh, to your pressure, and then a relatively large B also, although not as large as these other ones. Um, so it, it also depends, of course, remember, on the moles. The more of a gas you have, that's N here, the more of a uh, correction you need, because the more those issues, the intermolecular forces and the volume, are going to be important. So questions about that? All right, there's a problem on your homework with this, too. This is not a tricky thing. It just is a plug numbers into an equation thing and solve them a little bit differently from before. You'd have to be given tables of A and B to do this, which would be pretty obvious if you need to or not. The trickier part of this, yeah, I think, is the theoretical questions. If I asked you um, something like this. Here's a, a figure from your book. This is PV divided by RT. At, for water at three different temperatures. Rank the curves in order of increasing temperature. So which curve corresponds to a high temperature and which curve corresponds to a lower temperature? Remember, PV over RT is supposed to be constant, right? That's supposed to be number of moles. The fact that it's not, uh, that it changes with different temperatures, means that something else is going on here. So what do you think? Well, let's talk about what's going on. What's the difference, would you say, between Let's just look at the extremes. What's the difference between C and A? Describe in words. What's happening at different pressures? C is more broad. Yeah, C is more broad, and it's much lower pressure, or I'm sorry, much lower PV over RT, so lower, it's, it's predicting a lower number of particles as pressure increases, 
than something like A, which is predicting more uh, thing, more particles as pressure increases. So what's going on? Well, how would how might intermolecular forces play into this? If something had strong um, well, that might not be the right question here. Let me see what they're saying. Yeah, here's what the here's what the book says. I don't know if you can read that. Uh, curve. It goes A, lowest temperature B, and then C. Okay. A deviates the most from ideality. It's supposed to be straight. It's supposed to be the same the whole way. But because A deviates a bunch, that must be the lower temperatures. Because at lower temperatures, those ideas of intermolecular forces become much more important. At lower temperatures, the kinetic energy is lower. So what's happening between molecules becomes more important. And that's what this is showing here. Let's see if we can find another one. Uh, I think that's their only example, unfortunately. Well, here's a nice sum of everything. I should have put this one in the notes. Do that next time. So you have an ideal gas across the bottom, one, constant. And then you have a bunch of real gases deviating in different ways. And this is at constant temperature, probably at standard temperature. Does it even say? I don't know. But at constant temperature, different gases are going to deviate in different ways. And what you see here is that like water is always low here right, because of its forces. And uh, xenon, at low pressure, it deviates in one way. And at high pressure, it deviates in another way. So you can't always say, uh, whereas something like helium is a linear deviation as you go higher and higher pressure. So this is all to say that you can't really make predictions about what a particular gas will do in its deviations from ideality. You need to know those A and B numbers to be able to, to do something like this. Um, the idea is more in general, what happens? So if you're asked a question about what's happening uh, why is this thing deviating from ideality? There are two things that influence that. What are they? That's really the importance of all of this. What are the two things that influence that deviation? Well, I mean, two properties of a molecule. Right, volume is one, the fact that they take up some space, and intermolecular forces is another, the fact that they do interact with each other, even though before we assumed they do not. All right, we stopped early tonight. I'm sorry. Uh, what should we do for the next 20 minutes? What would you like to talk about? Really? What? We're having a flask at room temperature contains exactly equal amounts of, in moles of nitrogen and xenon. Which of the two gases exerts the greater partial pressure? Which of the two, nitrogen or xenon? exerts the greater, in, in equal molar amounts, exerts the greater partial pressure. All right, who says nitrogen? Who says xenon? Who says neither? Neither, neither, right? What, what did we assume? Well, what, we, we, not that we, we assumed, but we derived that partial pressure is proportional to what? To mole fraction, right? So if things have equal mole fraction, they have the same partial pressure. Partial pressure only applies with moles, not with mass. Okay. Now, let's see something that does. Look at the next question. The molecules or atoms of which gas have the greater average velocity? The nitrogen has the greater average velocity because if they're at the same temperature, room temperature, that's the kinetic energies are the same. The average kinetic energies are the same, but the xenon is much heavier, so it must have a lower velocity to compensate. What is that? A, neither. They're both. They're the same. Same. What about C? 
Molecules of which gas have the greater average kinetic energy? Why? Okay. But what is kinetic, average kinetic energy proportional to? And it's the same temperature, right? So again, they would have equal average kinetic energy. Velocity, the nitrogen would have greater average velocity, but the kinetic energies would be equal. All right, and then D, if a small hole were opened in the flask, which gas would effuse more quickly? The nitrogen, right. Okay, so those are the sorts of questions that, that I'll ask you about this theory, this kinetic molecular theory. Next week's quiz, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Have a lovely weekend, and I'll see you in lab on Monday.